So by this point, we've already seen several high-level state machines uh, being created. Um, I think it's worth some time, it, worth it to take some time to talk about how we actually design these things. We've actually already discussed this in class. Um, however, I, I do want to make a video also discussing these same design principles so that you could have something to refer back to uh, when working on the homework assignments. So to talk about high-level state machine design, we first need to talk about the design process for our traditional finite state machines. Um, the general process is not going to change that much. We just have to kind of tailor it a little bit to these new high-level state machines that we're working with. So let's take a look at the process that's used for traditional finite state machine design and talk about where the differences are going to be <clears throat> between um, designing a traditional finite state machine versus designing this high-level state machine. The first step is to simply understand the specification. That's going to remain unchanged. You cannot design something if you do not understand what you are trying to actually create. So the first thing you need to do is clearly define the problem and make sure you understand the problem that you're trying to solve. Step two was determining the inputs and the outputs. So um, this step is also going to remain very much the same to the process that we've used before. The one major difference in this step is that our inputs and outputs may be larger uh, using high-level state machines than they are under the finite state machines that we've seen uh, prior to now. Um, so it's not saying that they couldn't be single-bit inputs and outputs, but they are more likely going to be multiple-bit inputs and outputs. The third step is to determine what the circuit must remember. And this is where the high-level state machine starts to deviate from the finite state machine. They do still need states. So step three is in the, our finite state machines was used to determine what the states should be. And that part is not going to change with our high-level state machines. However, we now have this added functionality. So we have these added abilities um, in our high-level state machines. And so some of the things that we might need to remember now <clears throat> could, could eventually become variables instead of states. Um, so now when we think about what the circuit has to remember, it could be in the form of a variable, it could be in the form of a state, and it's up to you to decide which is the better option for any uh, given particular value. Um, the way, something you can use to help you make this distinction is think about how many possible values this thing you must remember could have. If, I had, if it has a very small number of values, uh, two for example, on or off, then I think that's a pretty good candidate for turn, creating those uh, using states. If it's going to be storing a lot of potential values, it could be you know, tens or dozens or even hundreds of different values, then that is a great candidate for a variable in a high-level state machine. Otherwise, we would have to create an individual state for each one of those values, and that's just not feasible uh, for most of these uh, state machines that we're going to be designing. <clears throat> So that's the biggest difference in this third step, um, is incorporating this idea of variables as well as states. The next step, then, is to construct the state diagram. And again, we have to remember that the high-level state machines allow us to do more than the traditional finite state machines that we've been working with uh, previously. So the state diagram consists of the states, which we've already determined in the previous step, as well as the transitions. So when creating the transitions, we need to manipulate the variables, and we can do that using addition, subtraction, uh, comparisons, etc. That's a, a pretty big difference from what we saw in the finite state machines uh, from before. So that is another difference between what we've constructed and, and what we've been working with. Finally, the last thing we need to do is write VHDL that's going to implement our high-level state machine. This is something we've already begun working on in class and we will continue to work on <clears throat> over the course uh, of the next uh, few weeks. Um, the biggest differences here are going to be, of course, we are now going to have more variables. So any variables that I have in my high-level state machine, I will need to incorporate those into my VHDL somehow. Um, most finite state machines we've seen up until this point do not have a lot of variables, so there was no need to create extra ones, but, but now we will. Now we are going to have to create extra variables. So I'd like to wrap this video up by actually going through this design process with a very simple problem. Uh, one of the problems actually that I pulled from the Zybook in section 5.3, the very first example given in that section is how to take a, uh, how to take a clock pulse and divide it by 10. 
So instead of you know having a clock go high every cycle, I'm going to have my clock go high every 10 cycles or every, I could even adjust it to go every 20 cycles or 100 cycles or, or, or whatever I want, right? Whatever value I want. Um, so we're actually dividing the clock period by a particular value to extend it out um, by a particular multiple. So that's step one, understanding the specification. I'm taking in a clock signal, something that's going high or low, and then I'm going to you, I'm going to elongate that by some factor. In this case, 10 is our factor. So step two is determining our inputs and outputs. In this case, that's actually a pretty simple step. Our input's going to be a clock, so it can be either high or low. And the output is also going to be a clock, just a modified version of that clock. So it, it's another single bit output that can also be high or low. Step number three says determine what the circuit must remember. So in this case, right, we need to consider states as well as variables. In terms of states, I think a good design for this machine is to use one state to represent the fact that we have not hit our multiple yet, that we still need to keep counting. And the other state could represent the fact that, oh, we have hit the multiple that we're looking for, so we need to update our output to emit a pulse, for example. Um, so only two states, I think, will do it. But we also have to consider variables in this finite state machine. So I need to be able to somehow count how many clock cycles I've seen so that I know when to transition back and forth. I'm going to need some kind of a variable to do that. Uh, we'll go ahead and call that variable i uh, in the same sense that we call loop variables i in Java code or C code because this circuit is very much going to resemble a loop. And then finally, we can construct the state diagram so the state diagram is given to you in the Zybook. Um, here it is again, the same diagram from the Zybook. These are the two states that we determined. So this state represents the fact that we have counted the, the number of clock cycles that we want. This state over here is, is the state that represents we haven't found the number of clock cycles that we want. We need to keep counting. And so really, this step in, involves uh, filling in the transitions. So we can see here, this is labeled as my start state. This transition just happens automatically. There's, you can see there's nothing that triggers it. It's just going to operate every single time, right? And then S1 has two additional transitions. If this I variable is less than nine, I need to stay here. I need to stay here and continue counting up, continue increasing my, my value. U is the output in this case, so U is going to remain at zero. And then finally, when I see that i is not less than 9, or when i is greater than or equal to 9, I'm going to transition over to this s0 state, which is going to reset my variable, and then change our output to be high for a single clock cycle, effectively dividing our clock cycle by 10. So this is um, actually, there's another important difference between this high-level state machine and some of the other ones that we've seen in, in class. Um, we've been working a lot with Mealy high-level state machines, and that's going to continue to be the case. Um, this is actually an example of a more high-level state machine. So you can see that all of the actions that are taken on the variables, as well as the outputs, occur on the states themselves. So this is an example of a more machine. The Zybook actually likes to use more machines, whereas in class I'm going to explore um, Mealy machines more often than more machines. However, I think it would be good practice for you to um, take this more machine, for example, and see if you could turn it into a melee machine. What effect would that have on the design of this high-level state machine? So that about wraps it up for this video. Uh, from this point, we're actually going to start moving into the direction of circuits. So how do I construct a circuit based on these high-level state machine designs?